First story. Delusional OP accused her boyfriend of cheating, lashed out at his daughter, and told him to just die, believing her manipulative therapist's lies, now regretting everything. To start things off, my boyfriend and I have been in a relationship for five years, and this entire relationship has been the highlight of my life. I've never been happier. I'd like to say that we had a pretty solid relationship. My boyfriend had a little bit of trouble expressing himself in the beginning of our relationship, but we had since then established a sense of trust between the two of us, and he felt comfortable enough to start opening up to me more. I have no doubts that I want to spend the rest of my life with this man. We had discussed marriage and adopting kids in the near future, and I was really looking forward to it. He's attractive, sweet, open-minded, and overall a very nice person to be around. Although he tends to be really quiet at times, and would often tend to keep to himself, if he's stressed out or something is bothering him, or would often start to become a little distant, which kind of started this whole thing. My boyfriend works as some sort of doctor at a hospital that is an hour or so away from where we live. I had moved in to live with him maybe a year or so ago. I live there with him and his daughter 12F. I work at home. Starting maybe a month ago, he had started coming home later on some days. He leaves work at 8 p.m. to arrive home at around 9.30 p.m. As of lately, he would often return home at any time from 11 p.m. to even 2 in the morning. For context, I wasn't concerned the first time this had happened, as he had texted me at around 7 p.m., telling me not to wait up for him and to make sure his daughter went to bed on time, as he would be coming home late due to something that happened at work. Due to the nature of his job, he would often get called into work on days that he had off or hours where he wasn't supposed to be working. He gets paid overtime, and it was never too frequent so it never was a problem. However, these late days at work had started becoming more frequent. He would always text me beforehand and would try to make up for it on his days off by taking me out on dates, going to movies, or taking me to concerts and stuff. But I had brought up the fact that I didn't want him to stress himself out too much since he tends to do so easily. He also has a history of mental health issues anxiety depression and has since been getting better, but I wouldn't want him to relapse or anything. Aside from that, Everything else seemed to be normal. It started out as me simply being concerned for his health and stuff. He had started to use his phone more frequently from that time onward, but claims that it was work-related or talking to co-workers. He had never used his phone much, as he doesn't actually have friends or relatives that he stays in contact with. But he said it was work-related, so I believed him. Granted, he was normally at work all day or night and started to become busy on his days off. I had never questioned it as he doesn't have to focus on me 100% of the time, and I felt like he needed some time to himself as well. We were beginning to spend less time together as a result, and because I never questioned anything, I really had no idea what he was doing when he wasn't around me. I guess I was starting to feel a little lonely and neglected, and I don't know why I wasn't just talking to him about it. I guess I'm just stupid or something. Instead, I brought it up to my therapist who I had been seeing since I was 18 due to homophobia in high school college and at my job that I have since quit. I told her about the situation and how neglected I felt because of it. Instead of telling me to talk it out with him, she immediately implied that he was cheating. I trusted my boyfriend and had denied it because I believed that my boyfriend would never do such a thing. And then she began to insist, saying things like, You've seen it, right? I'm sure he could get any girl he wanted. I'm sure girls are all over him, and he probably couldn't resist them anymore. My boyfriend is bisexual." and I asked her why she kept mentioning girls instead of other guys, and she only replied, saying that from what I've told her. He sounds like he's just straight, but pretending to be bi just because I asked him out. Which sounds like total BS in my opinion. But she then told me to think about his dating history, and the fact that he's only ever dated girls too that I know of. She told me that I just wasn't enough for him anymore, and that I should look into polygamy, or just end the relationship. The session was over by that point but I didn't even bother going home because I knew he wasn't going to be there. I stayed at my cousin's house for that night, but the therapist's words kind of fed into the anxieties I felt when we first started our relationship. I've always felt like I was way out of his league and kept comparing myself to his ex. I don't know. I guess I felt like I wasn't attractive enough and that my personality was overwhelming especially for him, since he's generally a quiet dude, but I tend to be very eccentric at times. This had been a problem at the beginning of our relationship but he managed to convince me that none of that really mattered and that he loves me the way that I am. I felt like all of that coaxing was just swept away from what the therapist had said to me. In the session after that, she had started by asking me if we had finally broken up 
to which I responded that I hadn't really spoken to him since then. She then moved on to say that his coming home late thing is a huge red flag, and when I told her that he said it was for work, she told me that he was definitely lying. She said it with so much conviction and certainty that, at that moment, I didn't even know who to believe. She said that he had another relationship aside from me, someone that he actually loves, and that is better suited for him, and she said that I should just get up and leave. She said he's probably manipulative, and that I shouldn't speak to him about it, because he'll just lie, and that I'd be stupid to believe him. She told me that I was blinded by love, and was refusing to see his true colors. I think it was at that point where I had actually begun to believe that he was cheating on me. She said that he was never attracted to me, and that he had kept me with him, only because he smoothed the lies over with pretty words. I'm pretty sure I started crying at that point, because I felt like the four happiest years of my life were just complete lies, and that, in return, my happiness was just a hoax. I felt awful and empty. The therapist did nothing but hand me a box of tissues and tell me that I was just better off leaving without looking back. I didn't confront my boyfriend about it because I believed my therapist when she said that he was lying and manipulative. She painted this awful, ugly image of him in my head, and I didn't know what to believe anymore, and I just broke down. I just felt so betrayed, and I didn't know what to do, and I just bottled it up inside with my therapist constantly feeding into my despair with every session. She was a professional that was supposed to make everything better. And I knew her for longer than I knew my boyfriend. And she said that I could trust her instead. I stopped staying at my cousin's and mostly stayed in my office room. I had distanced myself from the other two people that I lived with and just sat and boiled in rage and jealousy and all these ugly, gross feelings. I remember vaguely his daughter coming to check up on me and asking if I wanted food or something. And I had snapped at her and yelled at her and said all these awful things. And I feel terrible about it now because she had nothing to do with it. My boyfriend who really has no idea how to properly deal with people, had tried to ask me what's wrong before and had failed on the multiple occasions he tried to do so because I was just being selfish and stupid and clamming up. And he in return became distant because he just didn't know what to do with me. And I basically shot down all of his attempts at speaking to me because I didn't even want to be in the same room as the lying, cheating, manipulative bastard that dared to breathe the same air as me. It's like the most powerful love I had for someone became the greatest hate. Those days were just a blur to me. It was only after his daughter slid a handmaid, get well soon, card under the door to my bedroom that I almost completely lost it and broke down and tried to confront him to tell him that I couldn't do this anymore and that we were breaking up. He had come home from dropping his daughter off at band camp and it was just the two of us and I felt like I came on to him too strongly. I don't know, I definitely wasn't in my right mind or something and I was being an idiot and with no context whatsoever or no greeting, I just looked him straight in the eye and told him off for cheating on me. It was positively the most confused expression I've ever seen him wear, and he normally isn't even that expressive. Instead of cutting me off, he waited until I was done, until I was just a crying heap of pain on the living room floor. He didn't come close to me because I had said that I hated being in the same room as him. He just asked, Where is this coming from? And I could hear the emotions in his voice, and it hurt. I realized that I literally didn't have any solid evidence that he was cheating, but I was too wrapped up in my hate to even care and I brought up the late nights and the mornings where he wouldn't come home and the days he took to himself sometimes. But I didn't tell him that it was someone else who didn't even know who he was that told me he was cheating because that sounded stupid and insane. He started to apologize to me, and I was just crying and telling him that I wasn't going to listen to him, that he was a liar and a terrible person, and that he should've just killed himself when he was really deep into his depression a few years ago. And I just said all of these awful things that no person deserved to hear ever. And he didn't even get mad at me, he just kept apologizing. And I got mad that he was getting upset, because it was my problem. And I had convinced myself that he doesn't feel guilt, and was just putting on a show for his image or something. He said that he was so sorry that I felt this way, that he didn't know, and that I should have said something to him so that he could make amends. And he said that he definitely wasn't cheating on me. He said that I could check his phone, and go through his laptop, and call his boss to confirm that he actually had been at work. He said that the days he took to himself, he had gone to a shelter that was near his job to look for a dog, because I had been constantly pestering him for one, and he said that he wanted to get one for my birthday. He showed me the papers and everything, and I lashed out only because I felt stupid and embarrassed. I don't know. He said that he'd give me some time to think, and he said that he wasn't cheating, and that if I was truly unhappy with our relationship, then I could leave. He didn't say it out of spite. I can tell. 
He was more concerned for me than for anything else. I felt like a jerk. He had offered. So I went through everything. I spent like three days going through every message and every document, and I saw it for myself that he really was not cheating. I felt sick. I don't know. Maybe there's something wrong with me. I talked to him again when his daughter wasn't home, and I apologized, knowing that an apology would never be enough for everything that I've said and done and what I actually believed. He said it was okay, even though it really wasn't, and asked if I really wanted to break up with him. I said no. I said that I didn't mean anything that I said, and that I was just being a jerk. He told me not to say bad things about myself, and that everyone has those moments, and I literally just hate myself. He apologized again, saying that he's sorry that he couldn't be someone that I could fully trust or something, and I almost threw up. Again, his apology was genuine, and I felt disgusting. That was last week, and I know things like this won't just repair themselves overnight, but I feel like things have changed, and it hurts. Maybe it's all in my head, I don't know, but I feel like I ruined something amazing, and that it can never be repaired. Like he promised, he started coming home a little earlier. Some things can't be helped, and sometimes he still has to work overtime, but I really don't care anymore. He put in a request to change his hours, and his daughter is going to start going back to school, and sometimes it's going to be just us. And now I dread those days because I'd have to face the man that I had falsely accused of cheating. The man that had said all these disgusting things too. And the man that forgave me either way. And I hate it so much. It's not like I want him to hate me or anything. But I guess I just want to be punished. I'm not going to see this therapist anymore. I'm so done. I also refuse to tell my boyfriend that my therapist is the one who put these ideas in my head. Because it sounds like I'm shifting the blame or something. I'll probably look into another therapist. And my boyfriend suggested couples therapy, so I might as well. What can I do? What do I do with these gross feelings that are eating me away inside? I feel like I've just thrown away a nearly perfect relationship and exchanged it for something subpar. I don't want to break up with him. I want to spend the rest of my life with him, but I feel disgusted with myself. What does he think of me now? How do I repair this relationship? I'm at a loss here, and I'm just afraid of what the future holds. Have I broken our trust? I'm selfish, and I never want to let him go, so that's out of the question. TLDR. My therapist convinced me that my boyfriend is cheating on me. I lashed out and said a lot of hurtful things, and I hate the fact that my boyfriend forgave me, even though I falsely accused him and was acting like a total jerk. I'm sorry if this post is all over the place. I feel like such a mess right now. Second story. My ex-boyfriend called me fat and dumb before he broke up with me, so I ruined his PhD life. Ruined his research, got him fired, arrested, and got myself to a higher position in his field while making sure his life stayed ruined for the past 20 years. Sorry, this is a bit long. All names changed. Throwaway accounts for all the reasons. When I was in college in the 90s, I met Jake, then M23 through mutual friends. He had already graduated and was planning to move to the opposite side of the United States for graduate school, and I had already been making plans to move with friends only a 90-minute drive away from where he was moving to. We had so much in common, fell in love, and it really seemed like fate, both planning to move 3,000 miles and landing so close together. He had two sisters and a younger brother who were all awesome people, and I became instant friends with them as well. Because he was in school and I was working, I would usually go to him to hang out on weekends. He was renting a house with two roommates, also in his program. We were young, so money was tight, but we had fun went for taco dates, and spent a lot of time at his house, where he was breeding and selling small animals. Jake was an animal sciences PhD student, so being around animals was normal, and I loved it. I met and became friends with his advisor's wife, Mary, F. mid-50s who worked in administration at the university. She is a lovely woman, and I would often have lunch with her when I went over on weekends. Jake was a teaching assistant ta, and I met other people in the program and made friends with them faster than he did. After about two years of dating, I was at the house one day, laying in bed together, in a state of some undress, and he said, out of the blue, he was concerned I'd been gaining weight, and it made it harder for him to be attracted to me. No concern about my health. It was all about him finding me unattractive. I sat up and said, well, then maybe you should make sure there is better food for me to eat than crackers and cheese when I come up on weekends. Even at 23, I didn't take that kind of BS. I had gained maybe 10 pounds since meeting him two years earlier and still wore the same size clothes about a US size 6'8". I wasn't going to engage in a fight about it after all. 
It was his problem, not mine. So I asked him calmly, So what is your solution to this? He stared at me blankly and said, Well, I guess that you should try to lose weight. And I said, Nah, I'm not going to do that. So what are you going to do about it? He said, Well, I guess nothing. I wanted to let you know how I feel. And I said, Cool, thank you. I put my clothes back on, went to sleep, and drove home the next day as usual. We keep dating, and about three months later he called me and said he wanted to break up after close to three years. The reason and I quote, you don't know enough about science. He felt like he couldn't have a conversation with me about his work where he didn't have to use common names for animals instead of scientific ones. I said, well, that's bullshit. What's the real reason? He said it was the real reason. He came to see me a month later to return something of mine, and I confronted him, demanding the real reason. He finally admitted he had been seeing one of his undergrad students. Let's call her Meg, a 19-year-old. He was then 26 and her teacher. I screamed at him to leave. My roommate threatened to throw him off our second-floor balcony if he didn't go, and he left. It hit me all at once after he walked out, and I went from rage to stunned laughter. I'd met Meg a few times, and at one point, she was at his house for a BBQ and spilled something all over her pants. Jake asked me if I could loan her some sweats. I couldn't because I was a size 8, and she was a size 18. Nothing wrong with that, at all. But the point is, I realized he made those comments about my weight to try and get me to break up with him because he was a coward. He clearly liked a big gal. Although, when he'd said those things to me about my weight, it was 1M. I lived about 95 miles away, and we had just had his ex, so I don't know how he thought this would go. Even in hindsight, it perplexes me. Did he think I was going to break up with him and storm off into the night and drive for an hour and a half? Anyway, I emailed his roommates. It was the early 2000s. It's how you communicated anything you didn't want to say on the phone. I wanted to let them know we'd broken up, and that they were always lovely to me, and thank them for being friends. They both admitted they knew about Meg, and were the ones to demand that Jake tell me or they would. That's when he broke up with me with the lame. You don't understand science excuse. One of his roommates, a super nice, super cute guy named George, offered to help me get a few things still at their house that he had collected for me away from around the house. He suggested I come up for the weekend. We go out and drink and have a good time all the things Jake didn't want to waste money on. And I said sure. So I went up. And George let me into the house while Jake was gone. I took photos of all of his animals because, while I might not be a PhD student, I paid attention, and I knew he had an endangered species in his care. He wasn't breeding it. It was an unreleasable animal he had taken in from a rescue organization. There was paperwork he had to submit with a $25 fee, and he refused to do it saying he didn't want the government in his business. I took photos of that animal, all his breeding conditions, and a photo of an animal not allowed in the state, which was in a tank, right next to a window and visible from outside. I then went out for a night on the town with George. We stumbled in early, around midnight, so Jake and Meg, who were watching TV, would see me in a short dress, drunk, and George practically carrying me. I spent the night in George's room. He was a total gentleman, but made sure to leave the room and parade past them in his boxers a few times, and we giggled and moaned loudly so they could hear us. When I went to leave the next morning, Jake said I didn't have to act like a W in front of him as I ate a donut slowly in my rumbled dress with messy hair, while George beamed at me and then planted a kiss on my head. Meg looked ashamed, not quite knowing where to look, and I said have fun with my leftovers and walked out. I wanted to think the petty, loud, hook up, and a few juvenile insults were my revenge. It was not. The next day I had my photos developed, ah, the good old days, and called the state office of fish and wildlife. I reported the animals in the house, the potential overcrowding of breeding animals, and the two animals he shouldn't legally have at all in the state, and asked them how to make a report. Turns out Jake wasn't well liked by his peers in his program, or by his roommates, but I was. George had suggested that he and their other roommate could submit complaints to the university that Ata was sleeping with one of his students and showing her favoritism. The night we were out at the bars, we made sure to tell the story to anyone who they knew. They made sure all the women in his classes knew he was sleeping with Meg. It wasn't a large program, so people knew fast he had cheated, and was now dating his student, George, and the other roommate made sure people knew they had put in complaints, sick of Jake's entitled BS. With my full statement made and photos sent to the state wildlife officials, I called my friend Mary, Jake's advisor's wife. She knew about the breakup and lame reason, and I let her know he admitted he was sleeping with a student. I'd been emailing with him, and he admitted to it in writing, 
so I sent that to Mary. To say she was not happy about that was an understatement. She said she made sure it would be investigated and told her husband, Jake's direct advisor, while I was on the phone with her. Speaking of investigations, a few weeks later George called me, giddy, to say state fish and wildlife officials were there, confiscating animals. He told them he would be happy to tell them whatever they needed to know. Meg was there when it happened and told the officials that, as far as she knew, all the animals belonged to her boyfriend Jake and that they were all legal. That put George and the other roommate in the clear. One animal was kept in the backyard, so it was implied to Jake that a neighbor reported it. While they were there to investigate, they knew to look in the back window to see the far more problematic, illegal to have in the state under nearly any circumstances, animal. Since George was on the lease, he was able to let them in to investigate in the house. The animals were all in communal areas, and the officers stayed there for a few hours and returned with a warrant to take all the animals and enter Jake's room to investigate. George and the other roommate let them into their rooms with no issues and were quickly cleared. Meg apparently couldn't get a hold of Jake and eventually drove to the university to find him. Remember, no cell phones yet. It was a good day. The only animals they left were some guppies in a fish tank. Now, PhD students need grant money to do research, and a large part of animal studies funding comes from the federal government. Jake had just gotten an EP a grant right around when he broke up with me. So I called the EPA and asked how I would report that a person with a federal grant was being investigated for illegally harboring endangered animals. Long story short, he lost his EP a grant and had to make restitution on what had already been used, close to $30,000. He would never be able to get another federal grant. He avoided jail time on the state charges since all the animals were in good health, but lost all his breeding animals worth thousands of dollars since they were collected for safekeeping during the investigation when the two illegal animals were taken. In the end, he owed a $15,000 fine, and the two animals went to a nearby nature center. For years, I would stop by if I was in the area to visit them. The university revoked his scholarship and fired him from teaching for having an inappropriate relationship with a student. He somehow escaped being expelled, but it always shocked me that he never tried to hide the relationship with Meg and was so stupidly self-assured. He didn't even wait the four weeks until she would have been done with his class to start publicly dating her. By the university rules, he would have been in the clear to date her, not being her teacher anymore, and she would just have to avoid any classes he was a ta in. It never fails to make me laugh. After a few months, I emailed his sisters and told them I missed them because Jake broke up with me after trying to call me fat and cheating on me, and I felt weird contacting them. The girls told me he told the family I broke up with him because of the distance. I forwarded them emails that Jake wrote after the breakup, talking about how he fell for Meg, and he was sorry about it, but it was true. I couldn't keep up with him academically, and it made him attracted to Meg. Jake managed to convince his dad to pay for one more year of school, so he could get a master's instead of a PhD. And while I stayed in contact with his sisters and brother via email, and then social media, I largely let it all go. I got even, made some friends, Mary became like an auntie to me, and I went on with life. I went on to get a master's degree myself, and my specialty. Helping scientists and doctors communicate their work to lay people. You know, us dummies who can't remember all the scientific names. I swear, it happened by accident, not design. But I love it. And I work with everyone from small town doctors and nurses to pharmaceutical companies to museums to state and federal governments to film and TV producers. I travel a lot and speak and get to learn a lot of cool things about our planet and how things work. I knew through his siblings that Jake and Meg got married and had two kids. Meg dropped out of the sciences and became an accountant. Jake went back to breeding animals. Every once in a while, his sisters or brother would tell me something over for lunch or via text, but we had our own relationship that exists outside of him. Apparently when I sent a wedding gift for one of his sisters, he loudly complained at a co-ed bridal shower that all of his siblings still were my friends and didn't make an effort to embrace his now wife, Meg. Apparently the sister just laughed and said, I don't make it a habit to be friends with homewreckers. This is how Jake's parents found out how their relationship started and ours ended. Ten years after we broke up, Jake never found out I was behind reporting him to the state. And in the end, I didn't lie about a single thing, except maybe exaggerating a drunken make-out session with George, who is now a successful and tenured professor with a lovely wife and daughters. Fast forward about 20 years to a few weeks ago. I was at a university giving a lecture to a room of 250 undergrad and graduate students. In the end, I was mingling with a student afterwards, and I hear a voice say, Hey, OP, long time no see. And I realize it's Jake, 
and I didn't change the expression on my face at all. I was completely shocked, and my instinct was to play dumb. So I said, I'm sorry, help me out. Have we met at another workshop or lecture? He looked incredulous and said, it's me, Jake. And I said, I can't place you, but I would love to figure it out. Finally I gasped and said, oh my goodness, Jake. I guess I blocked you out and said, well, lovely to see you, and moved on quickly when he tried to reach out and hug me. I was happy to leave it there. With the satisfaction of him seeing me as a guest lecturer in a science department of a major university when he was just in the audience. The department chair and faculty who had invited me to speak took me out to dinner. And while there, one of them said, So you know Jake? I said I did it over twenty years ago, being vague about how. She went on to tell me he had been there for an interview for a teaching position and had spent a few days there observing, and they were likely going to hire him. I couldn't control it. I scoffed. When they all looked at me, I said, I'm sorry. I'm just shocked he's teaching after what happened at University X. They said what happened. And I said he was sleeping with a 19-year-old student when he was 26, and he had to leave the program without a PhD because he couldn't afford to stay after losing his scholarship. The three people I was with all looked at each other like they knew they had a problem and said, Wow, we'll have to look into that and change the subject. My old friend Mary retired a year or two now, but still friendly with her old collages called me this weekend to say a friend at the university. Let her know someone had called doing a background check about Jake, and they pulled his file, which included being fired, leaving the program with a lower degree, and the complaint letters from over 20 years ago about his conduct. Mary's name had been on it with her husband listed as the faculty advisor, so she thought she'd like to know. As a bonus, it had a copy of his arrest record for the illegal animals. I guess his dad had paid for a decent lawyer to get the record expunged after the charges were reduced, and he paid the fines so it doesn't show up on a standard background check. I don't think he's going to get that job. So I will return to my life, content that the universe comes through sometimes, especially if you give it a little nudge now and then. The best revenge is when you don't have to do anything wrong. You just have to help direct knowledge to the right places. If there is anything I can impart to any young women and men reading this, as I shimmy happily into my now size 10 pants, it's that if someone who is supposed to love you complains about your weight or looks, that is their problem to fix mentally not yours, and maybe it's time to check out what they are doing behind your back or simply move on. Remember though, it is their flaw, not yours. If Jake hadn't been a coward and tried to make me break up with him and just ended things with me in a mature way, I might not have found out about Meg and turned his own wickedness back on himself. Third story. My sister wants me to reconcile with my cheating ex because she is dying and wishes to be my wife one last time. And my wife agrees with my sister. Backstory. I met my ex when we were both ten. She was, is my twin sister's best friend, so we've always been kind of a trio growing up. We started dating at fourteen and got married at twenty-three. Thing got ugly though, because five years after getting married, she told me she had a month-long affair with her coworker. Apparently the guilt was too much for her, so she confessed. We tried to work through it, but after a few months of trying, I knew that despite the fact that I loved her, I couldn't trust her anymore. She told me she still loved me, and that she'd wait for me and prove that I was the only one. I wanted to believe her, but you know, something just can't be fixed. We never had kids. Three years after the divorce, I met my now wife 38F, and we got married two years after dating. She's everything I could ever dream of in a wife and more. My ex, as my sister told me they're still besties, never really recovered. She quit her job and is now working in a church. Throughout my relationship with my wife, she kept trying to get back together. And, on the day of my wedding, she told me she still loved me and would love no one else. She said this was the last time she would bother me, but that she'd wait for however long it took. Apparently, she's honest in that regard, at least, because my sister says she's never been with anyone since. So here's what happened recently. My wife and I, married for seven years now, have two kids 7F and 3A. My sister came over with her own kids so the cousins could play. While my wife was out to pick up lunch, my sister sat me down and told me the situation about my ex. Apparently, she only has less than six months to live. She refused treatment and wants to live the last few months to the fullest. I guess that's why she and my sister really went out of their way to travel despite the pandemic. One thing on her bucket list, though, was that she wanted to feel like my wife again. No s ex, no kissing. She just wanted me to be around the house. She still lives in the house we lived in again and maybe hold her from time to time. I told her I wouldn't do that because that was pretty much emotionally cheating. My sister kept arguing and begging me to at least see her and hear her out. We kept arguing no screaming, 
The kids were in the next room with her older daughter, till my wife came back. My sister told her the whole story. And while she looked upset, she said she understood where my ex was coming from. When my sister left, my wife and I talked about it. My wife knows everything that happened in the past with my ex. She says while she isn't thrilled about the idea, she won't get upset if I decide to see her on a regular basis. My wife is literally the best thing that ever happened to me, and I love her more than anyone. She makes me happier than I've ever been in my life, even in the good times with my ex. She knows I won't cheat. I also have no romantic feelings for my ex, so there's nothing lingering there. I don't hate her or anything. It's just that the love I had for her has long since died. After thinking about it for a while, I'm honestly 50-50 about it. I know I don't owe her anything, but I feel like I might regret not seeing her at least one more time, since the last time I saw her was on my wedding day, and that wasn't a good encounter for either of us, unless you count the times I occasionally see her in the store or something. I honestly feel like, despite what she did, she still deserves to go with some peace. On the other hand, I'm not entirely sure if this might potentially affect our marriage. My wife says she's okay with it, and I believe her. But I just can't be sure that she'll feel the same way after it happens. I don't want anything to jeopardize what I have right now, no matter what. I'm not too thrilled about going myself, to be honest. Any advice? What should I do? TLDR. The ex-wife who cheated on me wants me around in the last few months of her life. My current wife is okay, but I don't want to risk anything. Edit. Just want to add that if ever I do this, I won't be acting like a husband or anything inappropriate like that. Just going to see her and talk for a bit. My sister says that me just being there and sharing a meal with her would be more than enough for her to feel like we were married again. Update. Quick recap. My ex-wife, whom I've known since I was 10, cheated on me, but is now dying and wants me to be around before she dies. It's been almost three weeks since I've posted, and a lot has happened since. I got some solid advice from a lot of you guys, especially some who messaged me their personal experiences. I'd like to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. So here's what happened. As many of you guys suggested, I talked to my wife. We had a long discussion about the whole situation, and I assured her that no matter what, she is and always will be my first priority. I also assured her that while I wanted to say my goodbye, I would never act like her husband. It would be more like me seeing a childhood friend or something like that. I also told her I would never spend the night alone with her. She was more comfortable after our talk, and was pretty okay with the idea of me seeing my ex again. As you guys guessed, she really felt like she was forced into being okay with it when my sister asked. But this time, she really was okay. So I talked to my sister, and after a long, heated discussion about what my role would be in the visit, she agreed to the boundaries my wife and I set. A week later, my sister and I came over to our old marital home. It was surreal because while the emotions from years before came back to me, I didn't feel any sadness, hatred, or anything negative. I saw my ex, who was waiting for us in the living room, and she cried when I walked in. Most of you suggested she was faking it, but while she was still strong, you could tell almost immediately something was wrong with her. I indulged her with a hug, and we talked for a few hours while my sister made lunch. I showed her pictures of my kids and told her stories about what they're like. Honestly, I didn't know how I would react after I saw her again, but it just feels like seeing an old friend you haven't seen in a long time. There was no hate or anything like that. I walked around the house, and it was pretty much the way it was when I left over a decade ago. I'm not really sure how I feel about our wedding photos still framed and pictures of us still all over the house, but it wasn't really my place to say anything. The three of us had lunch and played board games all afternoon. It honestly felt like we were back to when we were kids and the three of us would hang out together. It was nice. I left at around six. She was sad, but she understood. When I hugged her goodbye, she whispered, I love you to me, but then said how she's happy I was able to find the happiness she couldn't give me. That part got to me, to be honest, and I was fighting back tears. I told her I'd see her again soon, and she asked if I could bring my kids next time. I told her I would and left to pick up dinner for my family. I told my wife everything that happened, and she was quite happy about the outcome. I guess it helped that I brought home her favorite food, but she also agreed to let me bring the kids next time. Overall, it was a great experience seeing her again. I feel like I needed that, and would have regretted not doing so. Again, I'd like to thank everyone who gave me advice. Also, please don't roast my ex too much. She made a mistake and paid the price, but that doesn't mean she's an evil person. This will be my last update.
Thank you very much, Reddit. Thank you for watching the video. If you are interested in listening to these kinds of stories, we've got more in store for you. Simply subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and share it with your friends.